Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to our latest edition of CTSS, You Make the Call. The way this works is you see a pair of images like this with a little bit of history, and we try to think about what's the first thing we think about. Then we'll look at it a little bit further, look at the correct answer, and maybe come up with a few good points. So let's get started. This patient has abdominal distension, and what you notice on these two images of the upper abdomen is there's multiple scalp lesions, including a partially calcified lesion along the surface of the liver. There's ascites and what looks like carcinomatosis. So to me, this is carcinomatosis. It could be something like colon cancer. It could be something like ovarian cancer. It could be pseudomyxoma peritonei. Those are the things I'm thinking about. And there's many more possibilities. So this was a little bit unusual. When you had more images, you saw the masses. Again, pseudomyxoma peritonei, cecal cancer, appendiceal cancer, pancreatic cancer, common duct cancer are all possibilities, ovarian cancer. Calcification maybe is more common with mesothelioma or just with mucinous tumors like adenocarcinoma. And you can see the extent of the process here, the omentum, the mesentery. Uh, you can see it very nicely on the coronal view. Really a very impressive example. I think we know we're dealing with carcinomatosis, but you'll need a biopsy and then the pathologist to really make it more specific. Sometimes you do have a clinical history in advance, but uh, sometimes it's just a uh, unknown. And in fact, in 20% of the cases, you're not going to find the primary tumor. Now, primary mesothelioma is unusual. We talk about mesothelioma in the chest, particularly related to asbestos exposure. Um, mesothelioma has been linked to toxic exposure to pollutants, particularly asbestosis. Same thing, it can occur in the abdomen for that reason as well. In this patient with abdominal pain, two images. I see a vascular lesion in the duodenum, roughly the first to second portion. The mass is about one and a half centimeters. It's slightly vascular. What lesions do you get in duodenum? First thing I think about is carcinoid tumor and gist tumor. They're both vascular. They occur in that location. You can have polypoid lesions, just basically duodenal polyps. You have to worry, of course, about the possibility of them having high-grade dysplasia. Unless it's invasive, that's something a CT cannot be certain about, and surely it can't uh, rule it out, and this lesion will be resected. But then I would say there are other unusual things that people tend to show you at case conference that can occur in the duodenum. So what can they be? Well, it could be metastasis. If the patient had a renal cell carcinoma, that would be a possibility. I don't see a renal mass here. The other thing that occurs in the antrum of the stomach or duodenum proximally particularly that's small, that's vascular, is an ectopic pancreas. An ectopic pancreas can simulate a tumor. It's a rare entity, but it's a good thing to think about as an incidental finding. Obviously, a biopsy will be done and prove it. It's also called a heterotopic or accessory or aberrant pancreas. Can occur stomach, duodenum, or jejunum. And as noted, most of the lesions are small and asymptomatic. As mentioned, in the stomach, it's most commonly in the antrum. What a great case. In this patient with abdominal pain, what are we doing? What are we thinking? There's a mass in the mesentery. The mass is solid, minimal enhancement. There are also nodes more posterior by the periodic region here and in the mesentery. When I see a mass like this in the mesentery, I'm thinking carcinoid tumor. I'm thinking sclerosing mesenteritis. Now, sclerosing mesenteritis is a benign inflammatory process. Greater than 70% of the time, you're going to see calcification. The truth is, in carcinoid tumors, you'll also about 70% of the time see calcification. I don't see that in this case. It doesn't exclude a carcinoid or desmoplastic reaction, uh, a desmopla uh, you know, sclerosing mesenteritis. The other point I was going to mention is, 
what about a desmoplastic reaction? Now, most things could give you some desmoplastic reaction, but carcinoid is the one that gives you the most impressive, and I'm not seeing that here. I'm seeing some haziness in the mesentery, and I'm seeing these additional nodes. So what else could it be? Could be a Castleman's disease, well-defined mass. That's usually enhancing, but that doesn't explain the additional adenopathy. Another thing you need to think about if you have a mesenteric mass, think simple, think lymphoma. Lymphoma can occur as big masses, small masses, you know, when it encases vessels and bowel, the so-called sandwich sign. You can see involvement of solid organs, which we don't see here. Again, carcinoids a great thought. Sclerosing mesenteritis I don't like for this one. And lymphoma is a great thought as well as adenopathy. And this was a lymphoma. Here's just a few more images which showed a little bit of a desmoplastic reaction, but I think the additional nodes are probably what's most helpful in you reaching the right diagnosis. Patient with chest pain rule out the section. So the little bit of descending aorta I see looks good, but what's this mass involving the patient's left atrium and right atrium? That's a tumor. Now, cardiac tumors, primary or rare, METs are 50 times more common. Things that involve the right side of the heart, angiosarcoma will be a primary tumor. METs, tumor growing upwards, melanoma, sarcomas. I don't see anything directly invading through the vessels, but I don't have all the images. Another thing you need to think about is lymphoma. Lymphoma has a range of appearances, which is what lymphoma always has. And lymphoma is a good thought in this case. And then when you scan the patient beyond the left atrium and right atrium, you can see how impressive the mass is. But as we scan downward, right lower quadrant, there's an ulcerating tumor in the right lower quadrant. Looks like lymphoma. Lymphoma involving the heart, sometimes it's primary in the heart, and involving bowel uh, secondarily, which was likely the case here. Just a beautiful example of a B-cell lymphoma involving the heart and with an ulceration involving the patient's small bowel. Really nice example. This patient who's a 10-year-old had a cough. You see a prominent thymus, but that would be okay for age. What's not okay for age is the extensive adenopathy in the pretracheal and retrotracheal space. And you can see it extends down and begins to narrow the airway. On these images, particularly look at the uh, left main stem bronchus. So what could this be? Now, it's a kid. You're not going to be thinking about malignancy. Malignancy, obviously, maybe it's metastatic Wilms or something. It could be lymphoma, bulky disease, narrowing of the airway. You have to think about also inflammatory disease, right? Particularly inner city patients or migratory patients, things like TB are possibilities. You also would put other things down. Histoplasmosis would be a thing to consider. And of course, some of the other entities that are, uh, depending where you live in the United States or worldwide. This eventually was diagnosed. There it is, some more images showing you the bulky adenopathy, some calcification. Again, TB is a great thought, but this ended up not being TB. Again, look at the airways in this case. Big subcarinal nodes. Left main stem bronchus is narrowed. Right's narrowed also, but not to the same degree. There it is with virtual bronchoscopy, and this was histoplasmosis. So a really good example. We think of TB all the time, and that's a good thing to do. Also think of other things like histoplasmosis. Also recognize a big thymus is a normal thymus in the right age. This patient is MVA with chest pain. When you look at the images, you see blood in the mediastinum, so you know this patient has had significant injury. I don't see the sternal fracture or spine fracture, but that doesn't mean much. Look at the blood around the arch, and then if you look at the proximal descending thoracic aorta, its outline is irregular. There's a linear line here. That means the patient has transected 
the aorta. Now, of course, you would have a lot more images. You would look at how the aorta looks. You'd look for secondary signs like sternal fractures. You look for rib fractures, spine fractures, but also look at the continuity or the loss of continuity of the patient's aorta. And this was an MVA with aortic tr transection. Again, on this image, it's hard to really call a transection, but you know this surely is a dissection. But here it is a little bit lower, big hematoma, posterior mediastinum, differential flow in the different components of the aorta, blood tracking down along the esophagus, and again, very nicely shown in the sagittal view. Look at the laceration, the tear, the extensive blood in the aorta, typical location at the ductus region. This case is a good example of the patient having bad luck being in a car accident, but good luck making it to the hospital while still alive. This patient was uh, repaired with a stent repair, and the patient did well. Here's just a very good look at this with cinematic rendering. We have a very nice article on this in emergency radiology, so it's probably worth your time taking a look at that. Incidental finding. When you first look at the heart, there's a mass there. That's obvious. First thing you might say is it's a node. Could it be a necrotic node? You also could think about a um, pericardial cyst, good location. But then you look and there's an enhancing thing going through it. And then you look and the patient had coronary artery bypass. You can see an infarct in the left ventricle. And so what are we dealing with? That's an excellent example of a pseudoaneurysm of a right coronary artery bypass graft. Here it is, a few additional images. First of all, nicely showing you the prior LV infarct, which was due to the coronary disease, which explains why the patient had bypass surgery. You see the enhancement, the vessel, and you have this aneurysm of the graft. And in fact, there were two of them really nicely shown on the coronal images, as well as the MIP imaging. There's the bypass graft, and there's two aneurysms or pseudoaneurysms present. Just a really nice example. Incidental finding cystic lesion tail of pancreas. Could be an IPMN, but I don't see a dilated duct. Could be an MCN, mucinous cystic neoplasm. Could be a cirrus a cystadenoma. But what you notice here, and probably would be shown better on later images or some narrowed windows, is that there's enhancement in the wall of the cystic lesion. The lesion that's cystic that most likely has rim enhancement is likely going to be a cystic neuroendocrine tumor. So you need to consider that as part of the differential diagnosis. And in fact, uh, when you look at this a bit further, this is a cystic neuroendocrine tumor. And you can see it. Here's an additional coronal view. You see the wall thickening better. You see the little bit of enhancement better. Often with cystic neuroendocrine tumors, there's a much brighter blush. This is as little as you get. But once you see the wall thickened, I think just blowing this off as an IPMN is a gigantic potential mistake. So don't do that. This patient has abdominal pain. They're a 30-ish year old female. Solid mass, head of pancreas, dense calcification. Now, if this was all cystic, I would have said a serous cystadenoma with central calcification, but a solid mass that calcifies. Well, you could think about a neuroendocrine tumor. Neuroendocrine tumors commonly have calcification, but they're usually more vascular. This is solid, but it's not vascular. It's fairly homogeneous. You can think about a solid serous cystadenoma, but this is almost too homogeneous, so I really don't like that possibility. Uh, a primary... Uh, adenocarcinoma, they usually don't calcify and they're not so well defined, particularly because it's a younger patient, but also just solid mass, calcification, well defined, no obvious duct dilatation. You got to be thinking about a spen tumor. This was a great example of a spen tumor, solid 
calcification. Now, spend tumors commonly calcify, but it can be in the periphery. It's not that it's a central calcification, which again pushes me more to serous cystadenoma. Just a very nice example. And of course, the average age of spend tumors is the 19 to 30 year old woman. It's about nine to one women over male. But we do see some men, but what we do also see on the women's side is younger patients, as young as six or seven, but we also see older patients over 50 or 60. So it's a diagnosis across a range of ages. And here's that same patient, very nicely shown in a coronal view. Here's a patient with an incidental mass, tail of pancreas with calcification. Now, what can calcify in the pancreas? We mentioned serous cystadenoma. MCNs can have dystrophic calcification. Occasionally, IPMNs in the periphery. This is pretty coarse. I think the thing I think about most when I see really heavy calcification, uh, I think a lot about neuroendocrine tumors. Now, neuroendocrine tumors are typically vascular, but not always. And so this ended up to my surprise, since this was a 75-year-old male. So obviously I knew it was a neuroendocrine tumor till the pathologist made the crazy diagnosis of a SPEN. First of all, it's a 75-year-old, which is extremely unusual. And it's a male, again, nine to one female predominance. But just a really nice example. And this is one of those cases that makes you think, that you're not always going to be right. But this lesion surely had to come out, though one could argue if it was a neuroendocrine tumor, it probably could be left behind because it's about 2 cm, and you could simply follow it. Here's just a few more views of that lesion, really nicely shown on the 3D map, how it's interestingly in the periphery of the gland, which is even that's a bit of typical for a spend tumor. Just really nice images showing you that. And that's it. Those are our latest and greatest set of cases. Um, you make the call. Again, two images. Think about it. Differential. It's not always the final answer that matters. It's how you think about it and how you manage to work up the patient. And with that, I thank you for your attention. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe to the CTSS YouTube channel. You can also visit us at ctss.com for even more videos, plus quizzes, pearls, protocols, and oh so much more. We're also in the App Store and have well over a dozen apps for iPhone and iPad, all completely free. Thanks for watching.